The news media and other Democrats say reports of Hunter Biden's massive corruption are nowhere near as bad as that time Donald Trump did nothing wrong. The charges against Hunter were detailed in a congressional report, which was issued in the form of a poster-sized photograph of Hunter under the words, Have You Seen This Man? The report says Hunter received a $3.5 million wire transfer from Elena Batarina, a Russian who became rich after receiving lucrative contracts from the city of Moscow, where her husband was mayor. Democrats say there's nothing to see here because it was the sort of payment anyone might receive from a deeply corrupt Russian businesswoman in return for absolutely nothing. The report also says Hunter paid large amounts of money to what appears to be an Eastern European prostitution or human trafficking ring. But Democrats say there's nothing to see here because Hunter probably needed a massage after carrying around all that heavy money from Alina Batarina. The report says further that Hunter made more millions as a consultant to the energy company Burisma, even though he had no expertise in the field. But Democrats say there's nothing to see here because they've ripped out their eyeballs and set them on fire. So there's literally nothing they can see. Even officials within the Obama administration were concerned that Hunter's behavior while his father was vice president might have created the impression that the Bidens were running a corrupt scam out of the White House. But Democrats say there's nothing to see here because skiddly wink shop on doo doo gragnats. Reporters immediately gathered around Joe Biden's basement to ask the candidate such tough questions as, what does it say about Donald Trump's soul that after killing thousands of people by giving them coronavirus, he has the gall to accuse your beloved son of some sort of wrongdoing just because he made millions off corrupt Russian and Ukrainian officials while you were VP? Biden responded, come on, man, here's the deal. And Democrats say that clears up everything. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. Hunky donkey, life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky donkey, ship shaped, tipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! All right, the massive behind-the-scenes conspiracy known as Clavenon continues. If you want to keep track of all the details, you want to go on YouTube and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Andrew Claven. After September 28th, I won't be on the Daily Wire uh, YouTube channel. the YouTube uh, Daily Wire station because, uh, not because I'm leaving the Daily Wire, just because they're absolutely ashamed to be associated with me and wanted to put me on site. Actually, they have their own content and I will have my own original content on the Andrew Clavin YouTube uh, channel. So please go on there, subscribe, ring the bell. You'll get all the latest and leave a comment because if your comment uh, is suitably incoherent uh, and ridiculous, we will read it on the show uh, just to raise the level of the comments uh, here. Uh, From Catherine Wright today, we have a comment. I used to be fat, lazy, ugly, and old, but now that I listen to Master Clavin, I have become 20 years younger, 50 pounds lighter, magically beautiful, and uncommonly effective in all endeavors. That's a true story uh, that actually does happen, and the results uh, are instantaneous, or Jeremy Boring will personally come to your house and give you your money back. Uh, (laughs) Louisville, after months of news reports that Breonna Taylor was shot down in her own apartment, Uh, After police barged in on her with a no knock warrant, an investigation reveals that the police did knock and announce themselves, even though they didn't have to. And that Taylor's boyfriend opened fire on the cops first and Taylor was killed in the crossfire when the cops fired back. But of course, the facts make no difference to the Black Lives Matter mob and their corrupt media enablers, just like it doesn't matter that George Floyd was a lifelong criminal with enough fentanyl in his system to kill him, even if the police hadn't treated him harshly. Or that Michael Brown, who first inspired BLM, was a thug who charged at a cop who then shot him in self-defense. That one was proved to be the case after an extensive investigation by Barack Obama's Justice Department. The United States of America is a great country, founded, fought for, and improved by heroes. Some of those heroes had the same color skin as Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Michael Brown. People like Harriet Tubman, Tuskegee Airmen, Harry Stewart Jr., and Martin Luther King Jr. have earned, earned their places in our hearts and in our history books. The injustices they faced were real, and their selfless courage should be remembered by all of us. But to paint angelic pictures of guys like George Floyd and Michael Brown, or to insist the tragic death of Breonna Taylor be seen as a purposeful act of racial injustice is an insult to this country and the people in it, no matter what color they are. 
To lie and distort in order to gin up rage and violence and a sense of victimhood is a sin. It's a sin against the truth. It's a sin against the country. And to my mind, it's a sin against the true stories of heroes like Tubman, Stewart, and King. And what's it all for? What's it all in aid of? It's not for freedom. It's not for equality. But it's in the name of a brutal Marxist system of oppression that lives, it always lives, by pitting citizen against citizen. That's how Marxism works. I spy on you. You spy on me. We denounce each other to our oppressive terrorist leaders in order to keep an unworkable system in place. These BLM clowns always shout, no justice, no peace. But there will be no justice and no peace as long as liars like BLM LM foment violence in the name of Marxist evil. All right, LifeLock, you're at home. You're using your computer a lot. You're online all the time. You want to protect your information. LifeLock's system monitors for identity theft, for the misuse of your personal information, and for credit score changes. You know, you think you're just a regular guy. Nobody wants your information. But the point is, identity theft is a big time crime. Criminal gangs actually have operating units dedicated to identity theft. They don't care whose identity they steal. It might as well be yours. Certain behaviors of yours can make you more uh, vulnerable to identity theft, like not checking your credit card or bank statements or using the same username and password on every account. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. LifeLock is on the case. They detect a wide range of identity threats, like your social security number being for sale on the dark web. And if they detect it, they'll send you an alert. Very useful. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But you can find out if your information is on the dark web. Get your free dark web scan at LifeLock.com slash Clavin. Pick the plan that's right for you and save up to 25% off your first year with promo code Claven. That's a free scan at lifelock.com slash Claven and 25% off with promo code Claven, leading you to ask the question, how do you spell Claven? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Uh, you know, I want to, we're going to talk about what's happening in Louisville, the riots and everything that came after this Breonna Taylor decision. But I want to just talk about this from a different angle for a minute, all this violence from a different angle. Leftist culture is dying. It may already be dead. It has nothing to say to anybody. You don't quote comedians anymore. They make the same same sad jokes about their penises and vaginas. That They have a kind of mentally ill uh, perspective on the human body. There's nothing new in that. It's not shocking or anything. The rap music, Cardi B's song, WAP. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not shocking or disgusting to hear this stuff anymore. It's just dead. It reduces human experience to a kind of machinery or a meat puppet with chemicals inside that the arts can't thrive. They can't live because arts are about the human spirit. They can't thrive or live under those conditions. And they've died. I mean, on Emmys, the Emmys, nobody watched the Emmys. I mean, literally almost nobody watched the Emmys, certainly about maybe a third or a fourth of the number at, that watched at their peak. Uh, they gave the Oscar a few years ago to that film Midnight, which was about a gay black guy. It wasn't a bad film. It's just a tiny little film and people don't care. No one cares. Uh, Moonlight, sorry. Uh, Novel sales are down to nothing. No one watches football anymore because we're tired of watching the athletes, these millionaire athletes disrespect the flag. These riots we're seeing are not a show of strength. They're a show of weakness. Okay, this is when you lose the culture, you lose the country. I've been telling you this for a long time. If you lose the culture, you lose the country. The right lost it. Now the left has lost it, but they feel they can keep it by force. The left feels they can keep it by force. It's like when the Taliban actually begins to govern and you suddenly see, oh, they can't do anything. They don't know how to govern. This is the problem that the left has. They can't do anything. They can't make their vision turn into art. They can't make their vision turn into government. So all they've got is intimidation and bullying. The question is now, do we have, does the right have what it takes to take the culture back. And that's going to be that is going to be the issue for the next several years. And it's going to depend on us, not on them, because they're through. They've they've run out of things except for violence and intimidation. So. They came back on this Breonna Taylor thing, and basically all the stories that we had heard, all the injustice stories that we had heard, turned out to be untrue. The police were fired upon. They announced themselves before they had a no knock warrant, but they announced themselves before coming in. The man who was with Brianna Taylor fired on them. And that part of the story is still unclear to me, at least. I, I don't know why you would automatically open fire on somebody, even if they came through your door suddenly. Uh, wouldn't you take a minute to look at what's going on? 
One officer, a detective, was charged with uh, re- being reckless because he kind of lost it, it sounds like, and started firing, spraying bullets all over the place. They went through the window of other apartments. So he was he was charged with something, but the other police were not charged with murder. And we don't know. The, the warrant seems to have had an error in it. It seems like the person who was supposed to be at that address was not there. So this may have just been a terrible, terrible uh, tragedy. We don't know. Tragedies happen. This is something about life. You know, you can always make a narrative out of a tragedy, but they do happen. And the police work very hard to keep them from happening. But, you know, there's a article, there's an article going around today. Police are rarely charged when they shoot somebody. That's because a vast, vast majority of the time they shoot people when they're under threat. And that is true. Even if the person is unarmed, people can do a lot of damage to you when they're unarmed. So there's been, so the riots were started uh, riots began. These guys were obviously ready. There were trucks parked with riot material with stuff to uh, use. They were throwing Molotov cocktails. Two cops were shot. It looks like the cops are going to be OK. Uh, but just in case any of this makes you feel bad that there's chaos, at least we know, at least we know that my friend Gabe, the police are on the job in Moscow, Idaho, where my friend Gabriel Gabriel Wrench, who uh, has a wonderful podcast called Crosstalk, uh, he was arrested for singing hymns in public in violation of the COVID lockdown as uh, cut to. You go through a lot of stuff. You got to just back up. You could easily stand up against the Marinals. Oh, wow, listen to that soundtrack. <sighs> you guys are tough people. We're gonna, we're gonna have to, guys, we're you know what's wrong, guys. Come on, guys. We back you guys. Everyone stood there. Everyone stood there hating you guys. We back you guys up. You know we back you. And no one, and no one did this to them. The people, No one did this to them. I have the right to assemble, and you guys are arresting me. Officer, this has to be getting to you, man. Are you sharing this right now? You have to know that this is not right. You have to know that this is wrong. What's going on? I'm getting arrested for not social justice. That's Gabe's brother. Yeah. Like me and you. Are you kidding? No. No. (laughs) There's there's language coming. The, the funny thing is, by the way, Gabe has a an actual uh, note from his doctor that he's not supposed to use a mask. So I, I guess that's what they're arresting for. They arrested two teachers, two music teachers for standing. They were married. They were arrested for standing too close to one another. Obviously, this is intimidation. I don't know if you blame the cops. I mean, the cops are trying to carry out uh, their orders. I think it's a good thing of, if for American cops to not carry out orders like that. But of course, the mask social distancing order comes down from the mayor. Uh, Gabe is running for his name is Gabe Wrench, R-E-N-C-H. Uh, he is running against uh, the Democrat Tom Lamar in the election uh, for um for the city council or the county, the county commission, I'm sorry, the county commission. Uh, so at least we know, at least, but we, at least we know that Gabe is under control, that he won't be singing hymns in a big hurry anytime soon, while they will continue throwing Molotov cocktails in Louisville uh, and shooting the police. I want to talk about uh, Daniel Cameron. Uh, you know, I always tell you, I give you tomorrow's news today. I spotted him right away. I think before anybody else, I spotted him right away because they were so busy. The news media was so busy running people down at the GOP convention. They didn't take the time to notice that Daniel Cameron got up and gave this terrific speech. It really was uh, one of the highlights of the convention. And uh, and so he had the an enviable task of coming out into what he knows is a tense situation governed by news media and BLM uh, narratives. He knows that these narratives are going around. He knows the outrage is being spread. He knows the lawyer for Breonna Taylor has a has an interest in spreading outrage, and the news media has an interest in backing them up because they're leftist, or they think they're leftist. They think they're leftist until the mob shows up at their door. And so Cameron came out and gave a great did a great job of announcing the results of an actual investigation that showed that the police had not broken the law. And again, we're not quite sure yet whether this is pure tragedy. We don't exactly know what it was. But let's take a li- look, a listen and a look at some of what Cameron said. This is cut eight. Justice sought by violence is not justice. It just becomes revenge. And in our system, criminal justice isn't the quest for revenge. It's the quest for truth, evidence, and facts, and the use of that truth as we fairly apply our laws. Our reaction to the truth today says what kind of society we want to be. Do we really want the truth, or do we want a truth that fits our narrative? 
Do we want the facts, or are we content to blindly accept our own version of events? We, as a community, must make this decision. Now, this is this guy is the real deal, and he could be a very, very major politician. He is, this is took courage. It took it takes courage. We've seen this. We've seen this, like the guy in Nevada who shot himself because the DA caved into the mob and charged him when he, com- he had committed an act of self defense. This guy did not do this. Cameron did not do this. Uh, this is a, a guy with a real future, and you can bet there's going to be a push to get him out of office. You can bet, and I wouldn't be surprised if our old friend George Soros is behind it. Let us listen to one more thing because this is an important point. These are local matters, right? If the cops are bad in a town, and that happens, you know, there are bad police forces, just like they're bad everything else. If that's something that the locals deal with, what we're dealing with is a narrative being forced down from above on localities. That's what they're doing. They're coming into this town and saying, ah, this is part of a nationwide story. It's not. The facts do not support that. And so basically, you have outside people, organized outside people, well-funded outside people, bringing violence to Louisville and basically catching up anybody who's local that they can into that uh, maelstrom. So here he is talking about that. It's cut nine. There will be celebrities, influencers, and activists who, having never lived in Kentucky, will try to tell us how to feel, suggesting they understand the facts of this case and that they know our community and the Commonwealth better than we do. But they don't. Let's not give in to their attempts to influence our thinking or capture our emotions. At the end of the day, it is up to us. We live here together. We work here and raise our families here together. So immediately, the the way you know that what he said is important and true is because CNN immediately went out to debunk it, specifically this. I mean, who can deny, who can deny that celebrities who knew nothing about Louisville, who know nothing about this case, who didn't do the investigation, who haven't examined the papers in the investigation, who didn't even probably listen to this, who can deny that they are already on Twitter putting out, oh, my heart breaks, my low, the outrage. You know, (laughs) what do they know? They don't know anything. We know they don't know anything. We know they march to a, a, a... uh, strict leftist beat, and they never vary, vary from it. So Laura Coates, the senior legal analyst at CNN, she comes out immediately and goes after this point that Cameron's making specifically because she knows it's true. It's cut seven. It was not coincidental, nor was his statements about, well, don't let outsiders or celebrities or the media or influencers try to tell Kentucky people how to feel, that you should make sure that you are understanding these are all outsiders. These are all sort of triggering words for people, all non to, um, you know, hidden gestures to show that he was demonstrating that he was well aware of the talking points that are out there. And I found it very problematic, particularly given the great odds and lengths that he had went through, excuse me, to talk about why he took so long to come to this conclusion, to put it before the grand jury, that he wanted to make sure that there was objectivity, that there was no hint of impropriety. Then you have a bullhorn in front of your face as you use these certain words. (laughs) How dare he? How dare he talk about objectivity and justice and reality and facts? Facts don't, you know, my my narrative doesn't care about your facts. My crazy, you know, ideas don't care about your facts. Unbelievable. And you have to remember, this is a sign that they've got nothing beyond the violence. They've got the political power that they when they can use it, and they've got the violence. You know, I, I compare it to the Taliban, not because BLM is as bad as the Taliban, but because when they preach Sharia law, it sounds great. And people go, ah, Sharia law, oh, the injustices against Islam. But when they actually had the chance to govern, they turned Afghanistan and Syria and parts of Iraq, not just the Taliban, but uh, Al-Qaeda as well and ISIS. They turned it into an apocalypse now scenario with heads on pikes and people being oppressed and beaten everywhere. Their arts have petered out on the left. Their governance has been shown to be nothing in their chazes and their chops. They've got nothing but terror. So they're terrorizing you in the name of terror, not in the name of justice. But that, however, has nothing to do with stamps.com, which is a wonderful way that you can get to the post office without going to the post office. The post office is great. I have been living off the, as a writer, you live off the post office, you need the post office, but I don't want to go to the post office. I don't want to get in my car and drive. I don't want to stand online. I just want it in my computer where everything else is. Everything else that I do is in there. The post office can be in there too. With stamps.com, it gives you all of the services that you will get 
at the post office. You can print postage on demand and you'll save money with discounted rates you can't even get at the post office. Stamps.com also offers UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no residential charges. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, saving you time and money. Right now, my listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Claven. That's Stamps.com. Enter Claven. Put your stamp right f- through your printer. You can put make a stamp onto your envelope, take it down, and mail it off with the question, how do you spell Claven? That's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's. There are no E's in Claven. All right. So... This thing, I I just want to go back to this Hunter Biden report because it really is egregious corruption that was going on in the White House while Joe Biden was vice president. Hunter Biden was dealing with the Chinese. He was dealing with the Ukrainians while Joe Biden was in charge of the Ukrainian uh, situation. He was dealing with Russians. He was getting money from them. He was spending money, apparently, on these uh, uh, sex slavers. We don't know what that's about yet. And and Joe Biden lied about it. Joe Biden said that he had never he said, I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. But the report includes testimony that he was informed and discussed it with Hunter. Now, the reason I go back to this is because just like with Black Lives Matter, they try to focus you on some supposed outrage that takes away from the fact that they've got nothing. They don't they can't govern. They're selling Marxism. They're selling the destruction of the family. They took that off their page, but it's still what they believe in. So they're selling nothing. They're selling oppression. But they so they have to keep you focused on what they think is the outrage. And because there was no outrage, there was a sad situation in the Breonna Taylor case because there was no outrage there, just like there really was no outrage uh, in in Fergus, uh, Ferguson, St. Outside St. Louis. They have to gin up that outrage and keep you focused on that. Joe Biden does the same thing. Anytime he's asked about his own corruption, anytime he's asked where his Supreme Court justices are, where's your list of Supreme Court justices, he always throws it back on Trump. Why aren't we talking about Donald Trump? Here is a clip that's from a year ago. It's been unearthed because of this report of him being asked about Hunter Biden. And all he's got is this kind of decrepit outrage where he tries to redirect everything to Trump. And of course, the press, the willing, their willing uh, idiots, let him do it. How is your role as vice president in uh, in charge of policy in Ukraine and your son's job in Ukraine? How is that not a conflict of interest? It's not a conflict of interest. There's been no indication of any conflict of interest from but Ukraine even, or anywhere else. But even the period. Parents, I'm not going to. I'm not going to respond to that. Let's focus on the problem. Focus on this man, what he's doing that no president has ever done. No president. <laughs> Focus on this. I'm telling you, don't be, you have no right to focus on what you want to focus on. You have no right to. I'm not going to respond to that. He does it with everything. He does it with the Supreme Court justices. He does it. They all do it. They all do it. You know, t- the other day in California, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's worth talking about. Governor Newsom banned the sale of gas powered cars as of 2035. So 15 years from now, when he's long gone, suddenly California is not going to have gas powered cars. Uh, really, that really is something that's going to happen. So, I mean, you know, first of all, with electric cars, electric cars use up as much and and uh, cause as much pollution as gas powered cars do. Once you get into the batteries and creating them and all this stuff, our electrical grid already falls apart when you turn on the air conditioning. The whole city goes black when you turn on the air conditioning because they've got that green, you know, new deal. They've got the green power where our electrical grid is powered by unicorn breath. So the minute you turn on your TV, half the city goes dark, but, but we're going to be all charging. All of us are going to be charging our cars. So, you know, they've just got nothing. They've got nothing. All they've got are these gestures, uh, distractions pointing back at you outrage, all this kind of emotion, but nothing that will work as governance. And you have to be fighting for something. That's the thing. Just to give you an example, uh, Trump was giving a press conference yesterday and they asked him this incredibly absurd question. This is cut 20. Will you commit to making sure that there is a peaceful transfer of power after the election? Well, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about 
the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. I and, understand that, but and, people are rioting. Do you oh, commit no, to making no, no. sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Uh, the ballots are out of control. You know it, and you know who knows it better than anybody else. The Democrats know it better than anybody else. Why is he even asking him? Why is he even asking him? And by the way, they've cut out the part where he says win, lose, or draw. <laughs> but if he wins, why should there even be a transfer of power? This is nonsense. And the usual suspects, the usual never Trumpers were, oh, they were wilting. They were wilting. You know, it's, it's really, this is getting annoying with these never Trumpers. They have gone down this road of illogic where there's somehow some ideal party that we're going to vote for that's not making any mistakes, it's not doing anything wrong. And they're actually going, you know, they're actually saying, oh, the Republicans, the Republicans shouldn't appoint a Supreme Court judge. It's so, it's just causing dissension. There's dissension. We, we need to have comedy. We need to all be together. We need unity. When has there ever been unity in a democratic uh, polity? When has there ever been unity when you're in a democracy? We're all supposed to be fighting with one another. We're supposed to be doing it according to the rules and with some sort of civility. But why on earth, why on earth would the Republicans not appoint a, a new Supreme Court justice to fulfill the uh, seat of, just, of Justice Bader Ginsburg? Why wouldn't they do that? I mean, th- would the Democrats hold back? It's, it's insane. But these never Trumpers have followed this line. So now they're saying, oh, Trump won't commit to the peaceful transfer of power. Well, first of all, the Democrats still haven't accepted the transfer of power. These riots, these riots that they are accepting and uh, encouraging and turning a blind eye to and helping with the bail of the people committing them, these riots are part of their non-acceptance of the peaceful transfer of power. Hillary Clinton w- didn't want, uh, doesn't want Joe Biden to concede under any circumstances. Cut 21. They have a couple of scenarios that they're looking at. Uh, toward one is messing up absentee balloting so that they then get maybe a narrow advantage in the electoral college on election day joe biden should not concede under any circumstances because i think this is going to drag out and eventually i do believe he will win if we don't give an inch and if we are as focused and relentless as the other side is (laughs) <laughs> so, and, and Biden, by the way, said they're going to need the military to take Trump out. This is uh, cut one. You know, I'm absolutely convinced they will escort him from the White House in a, in a, with great dispatch. <laughs> so they're not committing to the peaceful transfer of power. Listen, there's going to be a peaceful transfer of power unless unless, of course, Trump wins, which I, I actually suspect he could very well do. Then there'll be riots. Then there will be riots. But but the. the the transfer of power will take place peacefully, I do believe. But this is, it's absurd. It is absurd what essentially this reporter was asking him. What essentially the reporter was asking him is if the Democrats steal the election, will you accept it without a peep? That's what they were, that's essentially what they're asking him. Because they're not asking Joe Biden. They're not asking Joe Biden if he'll concede, if he loses. They're not asking him that. They're not asking him anything. I mean, the guy barely comes out of his cellar, so they don't get a chance to ask him anything. But they're asking, these are ridiculous questions. And the only thing that bothers me about it, the press is so corrupt. The press is absolutely cancerous with corruption. The only thing that bothers me about it is the never Trumpers. It really bugs me at this point that these guys who are good people, I know they're good people, but they have gone down the wrong road. You get a wrong idea. You don't let go of your wrong idea. It is going to come back and bite you on the tuchus, you know, I mean, this is the thing. When you go down that road, when you follow that road, you're going to start saying stuff like, oh, evil Donald Trump. He's not going to commit to the peaceful. He's destroying the American, you know, tradition, unbelievably ridiculous, just completely ridiculous. And to fall for the machinations of our corrupt press is really at this point a sin for anybody on the right side of the aisle. But at least the media, at least the media is now it now agrees, now agrees that the president has the right to appoint a Supreme Court justice to fill in for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They now agree that he should do this. This is cut a, a montage of media agreement, cut five. 
It would be rare for the Senate to turn the president down in an election year. 17 presidents, including five in the 20th century, successfully put justices on the court during an election year. Six Supreme Court justices have been confirmed in presidential election years. The Senate voted on seven Supreme Court nominees during election years. And a critical seat on the Supreme Court for now held hostage to presidential campaign politics. Refusing to hold a hearing on a Supreme Court nominee takes Takes the GOP's congressional dysfunction to new lows. Just hold the hearing. <laughs> Seriously? Just hold the hearing. Do you think people look at this as another one of those boots in the face to the president? Obstructionism that I am not endorsing. I think it's outrageous. What they want to say is he's got a three-year term. I mean, you were elected for four years, and you get, to, you get to nominate for four years. It is all about politics of the ugly variety. <laughs> now, how many of you guessed that that was not a modern day, uh, it was not today's news media, it was news media, of course, when they wanted Merrick Garland uh, in there to, repl to replace Scalia. Uh, that's from our friends at Newsbusters. They put that together. The hypocrisy, of course, drips from them. Anybody, anybody who pays attention to the questions the press is asking Donald Trump as if they were important is being gulled, is being conned. Anybody who pays attention to the left at all as a serious builder of a society is being gulled altogether. Hey, we are going to be uh, have a backstage for the debates. We are going to cover the debates in a full backstage. Uh, that's Tuesday, September 29th at 8.45 p.m. Eastern, 5.45 p.m. in the real world where we live. Uh, we will talk with uh, the God King, Jeremy Boring, Mr. Shapiro, that guy Knowles, and we will all watch the debates together and comment on what happens. It should be really, really interesting, but you got to subscribe if you want to ask us questions. So go over to dailywire.com and subscribe now. All right. So we're talking about the culture, the fact that the left's culture is dead. It really is dead. I mean, we don't care about their movies anymore. We don't care about their TV shows. We're not watching the Emmys. We're not watching the Oscars. We're not watching football. We're not watching any of that. However, good stuff is still being made. I told you about the film Infidel, which was the number one film of the weekend. Uh, this is Jim Caviezel playing a Christian man who goes over to the Middle East and in a moment of passion basically preaches to people and is summarily kidnapped. Let's take a look at the trailer if we've got it. Travel to Egypt is especially risky now. That is the latest travel warning. Hey, you're making this into a much bigger deal than it is. I have been following your blog, your writings. You are here because you are willing to speak honestly. Mr. Rollins, are you aware that Cairo will cost your appearance to over 45 countries? Many are saying you've crossed the line. What are you doing? Quite a show, mate. There I am watching Sally. When all of a sudden I see this milky white upper middle class American wanker who reckons he can preach to a billion Muslims. Well, I was invited. <laughs> film is by Cyrus Nawasta, an incredibly talented writer and director. Don't tell him I said that because he'll he'll never I'll never be able to talk to him again. But he wrote The Path to 9-11, which was so good uh, it had to be banned. It's never been released on DVD or for streaming uh, because it was such a good insight into the Clinton administration in 9-11. Uh, he did the stoning of Soraya M, a very important picture. And this picture, which is incredibly exciting. Cyrus, good to see you. Good to see you. I appreciate your coming on. What What's the inspiration for this story? Well, you know, I've been following all of these instances of Americans sort of uh, being detained, uh, arrested, kidnapped, and it, it, taken to Iran prisons. Some of them put on trial. Some of them held indefinitely. The most tragic story is that of Robert Levinson. And basically, I thought, nobody's covering this. Nobody is even interested in this. I remember when the Iran hostages being taken had created this new program on ABC called Nightline and made Ted Koppel a star. So I thought maybe there's a thriller that can be fashioned around this. And I you know, studied up on all of these cases of these individuals and decided, you know, the best way to go would be with a fictional character and narrative that is as consistent with what these actual people went through. And you know, that's where it is. You know, uh, Jim Caviezel, who actually was uh, Jesus, uh, he, he plays a, a Christian guy in this. I, th I thought this was one of his very best performances. I mean, he's a terrific actor anyway, but this is a very quiet, minimalist performance. Where, uh, my wife yesterday said he managed to convey the fact that this is a guy who lived with God inside him, that he had a spiritual life without ever doing anything. 
How did you, you managed to handle the Christian side of this in a very light way. It doesn't get, it's not at the center of the picture, but it informs the picture. Was that something you set out to do? Were you, were you aware that that was a delicate issue? Certainly. I mean, you don't want to be, unfortunately, they have this category called faith-based movies. And, um, you know, when, when I was growing up and I saw Ben-Hur or, you know, any of the other big spectacles, uh, about Jesus, uh, made by major directors of the time. Nobody called them faith-based, faith-based movies. They were just big movies that everybody went to. Now you get categorized. And uh, I just felt that there's a way to do this where fundamentally this is first and foremost a thriller and uh, a suspense ride, and it has to play that way. But also it's touching upon a contextually something that no one has addressed in a Middle East thriller, which, you know, when you go to the Middle East and I've been throughout, I've, I've lived in Iran, I've made two movies in Jordan, a movie in Morocco, I've traveled a good bit there. One of the first questions the average man on the street asks you is, do you believe in God? Hmm. What religion are you? Do you go hmm. to church? And none of these Middle East thrillers ever address those issues. And I think it's fundamental uh, to the region and to any kind of political sort of analysis of interaction between the West and the Middle East. You know, that brings me to another question. How does a picture like this get made? The idea of a Christian man, a specifically Christian man, being kidnapped and abused for by, by Muslims for being Christian in a Muslim community obviously is not something Hollywood wants to deal with. It's the opposite of politically correct, but it's, it's the opposite of politically correct, which is true. Uh, how, do, how does a picture like this get made? Uh, independently, completely, <laughs> across yeah. the board, independently, uh, outside of Hollywood. I don't think I, I, outside of the actors I was trying to get, I don't think I showed this script to anyone in Hollywood. I basically called my agents and say, I'm getting on a plane. I'm going to make this movie. Oh, yeah. What movie is that? Oh, we don't know that one. <laughs> well, <laughs> because I just I just knew there was no ground to be gained by going through the standard, you know, procedure. Um, so, you know, this was uh, a executive produced by Dinesh D'Souza and Debbie D'Souza, who obviously have had success with their documentaries. Uh, they wanted to go into sort of what they call the gold standard, which is, you know, dramatic motion pictures and see if they can make an imprint. So they came to me and I told them, you're nuts. No, I, t I said, let's let's come up with something. Let's find something. And they had some ideas. I had some ideas and uh, they went uh, they went along with it, <clears throat> gave me a lot of room, ran interference for me and I couldn't be happier. Uh, they, they were terrific to work with. Yeah, I mean, you did great in the first weekend. It's kind of a good time to bring out movies because there aren't a lot of movies around. So it's 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 helpful for an indie film to be in this kind of atmosphere. I, I just have to ask you also, I, I don't want to leave this guy out. What's the name of the guy who plays the main villain? The guy who is con uh, the confronts is, confused. The, the character's name is Ramsey, but uh, the actor's name is Hal Ozan. And <laughs> Hal is uh, terrific in the movie. As He's you know, unbelievable. I mean, he's in he's in this room. He's in this room with Jim, who's turning in one of his great performances and he matches him beat for beat. It's really great. Yeah, no, he's he, he's terrific. Uh, How did, great. Yeah. How did I find him? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> where did he come from? I found him at a cigar party. Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> where else? <laughs> I, 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 I was writing the script at home and you know how this is. You, 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 you're, I'm trying to write an East London accent and I'm very bad at it. So, so I, I'm writing this thing and I decide to go to this cigar party and sure enough, I hear this really loud, obnoxious guy about 20 feet behind me speaking in an East London accent. And I turn and look at him and thought, boy, he looks like he could be Middle Eastern. I wonder if he's an actor. <laughs> I went and spoke to him and in, in actuality, he hadn't acted for years. He was, he's kind of writing and developing TV shows. And I told him nothing about the movie, but what I found from him in person was he was edgy, but also appealing. He had a he had a dark charisma about him, and I thought this is perfect for this character. So um, you know, 
I told the casting directors, this is my guy. And they said, oh, don't you want him to come in and audition? I said, no, this is my guy. Mm. We're not paying him enough to put him through that torture. <laughs> so um, he, I think he's sensational. It's, yeah, it's a great it, performance. you know, when you get an actor like that and you take a chance and he delivers exponentially, uh, you're just, you're giddy as a director. I just sit there and watch him and I'm, you know, I'm laughing inside at this guy. He's so good. <laughs> Yeah, it really is terrific. Now, your your films have an afterlife that a lot of films don't have. Stoney and Soraya M is still being shown underground in the Middle East. But it's one film, and I bring this up every time you're on because I think it's a, a major important story. And when I once tried to write about it in the Washington Post, they actually told me, no, you may not write about this. You may not include information about this, which is the path to 9-11. The path to 9-11 was one of the uh, biggest uh, television movies ever made. It had scenes. It was very fair. It showed how both George W. Bush and Bill Clinton allowed 9-11 to gather. But it did show scenes of Bill Clinton refusing to take out Osama bin Laden because he was immersed in this uh, scandal, the sex scandal, and which is real. That's a true story. You actually did it tread very lightly on it, but it's a true story. And the Clinton camp went nuts. And they still, you now cannot get this film the path to 9-11 on DVD or on streaming or anything. Is there any hope this is ever going to come out? I kind of doubt it. Uh, It's never been rebroadcast, never been released on DVD. I have many copies of the uncut version in my garage. If somebody wants to come over and get a couple, (laughs) (laughs) I give them away. But uh, it's, it's really sad. I mean, it was a classic example of a sort of, you know, left leaning media sort of snit uh, that they were, they kind of like where they're going crazy about this Supreme court thing, you know, it's just, just just sort of an unreasoned uh, insanity that takes place. And um, you know, everything that they objected to at the time and questioned has sort of been proven true over the years. Hmm. I mean, and the impression was even given by the media at the time that I had made up this whole thing that Clinton had these opportunities to get bin Laden. I mean, it's just silly. That's a, that's a granted historical fact now. And if anyone had done even a a modicum of research at the time, they'd have found that. All right. I got to stop there. Cyrus Nawasa, the writer director of Infidel, go out and see it. Cyrus, always good to talk to you. I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Drew. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, listen, there's one last thing I got to deal with. You know, we talk about the arts and we talk about uh, the culture and all this stuff. And, you know, talking about politics is very big now, right? You can make a good living. You can you get a lot of t- attention doing that. I've always tried very hard myself to contribute to the things that I talk about. So I talk about the arts. I try to make art. I try to make another kingdom in the Gosnell movie. I just handed in a new novel yesterday or the day before. Uh, I try to make the things that I talk about, not just talk about the things. And another guy who does that is Dan Bongino. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Dan Bongino, not only because he can tear me apart with his bare hands, uh, though that's the main reason I respect him. But I also have a lot of respect for him because he's not just a big time talker on, uh, with his podcast, with his appearances on Fox News. He also does things about the things that he talks about. So, for instance, he talks a lot about the news media and he talks a lot about social media. And he built the Bongino report to fill in when the Drudge Report became uh, unreadable. And the Bongino report is now what I go to in the morning when I instead of going to the Drudge Report. He built this thing. He helped build this thing, Parlor, which is to replace Twitter. Uh, Dan has got a tumor on his neck, which he announced yesterday on his podcast, uh, and is going to have to deal with that. And, um, uh, you know, the way I feel about that is like, you know, a tumor on the neck of Chuck Norris. I feel bad for the, t- the tumor. Uh, and I know he's a tough guy, and I know he's going to uh, take it out. But if you've got prayers, you should be praying anyway. Uh, so if you've got prayers, send them up for Dan Bongino, because, you know, this is he's first of all, he's also a, a terrific guy. He's a good guy. A lot of fun to talk to. But, you know, this is um, it's important, the players that are in place. And he is one of the more important players that are in place, not just because he's a popular talker, not just because he um, because he can convey a lot of good ideas, but because he does stuff uh, which is even more important. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk going on, but a lot of talk, but not enough reporting, not enough in the arts, not enough building. And Dan is a builder. Anyway, even if just for the fact that he's a good guy with a great family, you should pray for him. Uh, but please put up a word for, for Dan. I, I know he's going to be okay, but, uh, I think, uh, 
we, he can use all the help we can we can give him. I got to stop there. That is a, a perfect entry to the Clavenless weekend, which uh, will even just get worse <laughs> as we go forward. It always does. You know, they'll be screaming, they'll be gnashing of teeth, you'll be cast out into the exterior darkness uh, and uh, probably won't make it back. But if you should survive, I will be here again on Monday. I will. And it will be the Andrew Claven Show. And I will still be Andrew Claven. I will see you then. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wadowski. Edited by Adam Saivitz and Danny D'Amico. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, or head and makeup, is by Nika Geneva. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there.